like you. And God, that you would receive all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. Man, I tell you, the little ones are all excited like you just, they're about to bust, you know. And so uh, thank you for being here this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, open with me. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse number 8. Amen. Luke chapter 2, as the staff was preparing for this service and for the service tomorrow night for Christmas Eve, they, they said, so pastor, is there anything different? I said, well, the story's still the same. <laughs> you know, we kind of really can't change the Christmas story and we can't change the Easter story. It is the true story. Christ came, Christ died, Christ arose, that we might have life. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 14, simple titled message, Merry Christmas. It was God saying it to us as he said it to the shepherds. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger." And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. As you prepare for Christmas, I hope that you have stopped to worship the one that this is all about. The announcement comes. Can you imagine? You're minding your own business. You're doing your normal routine. These shepherds are, are doing what they do every night. They're, they're watching the sheep. They're out there. It's become mundane and routine. It's the same old thing every night. The sun's going to go down. The stars are going to come up. They have to watch for predators that would try to sneak in the night and destroy the sheep. Hmm. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. Why the shepherds? Why in that setting? I mean, they weren't considered people who would be the greatest witnesses in the culture. They, they weren't the upper crust or the elite. They weren't the ones that people would run to and listen to. But you see, I think in their routine, not only was God bringing the message of the birth of his son, but he was giving us the picture. The Bible says that we are the sheep of his pasture. The Bible tells us that our enemy Satan is a roaring lion. He's a predator seeking to devour those sheep. Oh, but the announcement of the Savior is the announcement of the Good Shepherd. The one who'll lay down his life for the sheep so that the sheep can be protected. What you see is a picture of who Jesus is and what he's come to do. On that night as they're there and it's the normal routine. Oh, they've seen predators come. They've seen action in the middle of the night, but they've never seen what they were about to see. All of a sudden, as they're there keeping watchful eye over the flock, the Bible tells us that the angel of the Lord appears to them. One angel. It's the messenger angel who has come to bring, to speak this glorious message to them. That God's plan and the prophecies foretold by God through the prophets of old is coming true this very night that the Messiah has arrived. And the angel speaks to them and brings this great message. 
But I want you to notice a few things that were different. They'd never seen an angel. (laughs) We know that because they were full of fear. We'll talk about that in a moment. I'll tell you something else they hadn't seen. They hadn't seen the glory of the Lord before. Look in verse 9. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. This is the Shekinah glory of the Lord. It is that evervescent presence of God that is so pure and so powerful. It is the light that the New Testament describes that has come into the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. It is that glory that Moses saw on the mountain when he went up one-on-one with God and he said, I want to see you. And he said, you can't look upon my face and live. And so he turned his back and he passed by. And the glory of God so shone that when Moses went down from the mountain, his face continued to radiate the glory of God that he had taken in and seen on that place. I'm telling you on that night, those shepherds had seen stars before. They'd seen glory glorious moonlight night, but they had never seen the glory of God in its presence and its power light up a night like it did that night when the messenger of God showed up with the glorious good news of the gospel. Oh, it was a different night for them. Quite an encounter unlike anything they'd ever seen before. But I want you to just notice in verse 13 that All of a sudden, it wasn't just this angel having a conversation. But it says in verse 13, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. Can you imagine? All of a sudden, this angel tells them the good news of the gospel that the Savior has come. The glory of God has, has lit up the night. And all of a sudden, the entire choir of heaven steps down. The veil is torn and they step down into their world where they can see. And the choir of heaven is standing there with them to announce the coming of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It was an incredible night. It was an announcement like there would never been before. Oh, there's been the announcement of kings being born. There there have been all kinds of announcements throughout the ages. Monarchs that have announced the birth of a new son. Even in our world today. I mean, it's amazing to me how our world still gets excited when a royal couple's going to have a baby. I mean, we fought the British to be free from them, and we're the ones that stay glued to the TV watching to make sure the new kid's going to be born. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. There's never been an announcement like the king of kings. Never. With all of their money and all of their gifts and all all of the things that they could produce. They couldn't produce the Shekinah glory of God in the sky. They couldn't produce the choir of heaven announcing it. They couldn't produce what these shepherds had a front row seat to. What an encounter. It's the encounter of Christmas. And by the way, it is the very thing that can happen to any soul in the dark night of your life. That the glory of God can shine in the darkness of your heart and of your life and change your world with an encounter of Christmas. That Christ has come to set you free and to redeem you and to save you. He's come to bring you out of bondage and out of darkness to set you free and to bring you into the kingdom of light. Wow, what a message, what an encounter. I'm sure these shepherds never forgot that encounter all the days of their life. And so, for those of us who have encountered Christ and have had that life-changing encounter, the light of God shining the darkness of our hearts and our lives, And revealing our sin and showing us the love of God who's come to redeem us and we've been saved. We should never forget the encounter we had with him who changed our life. Never. There should be no reason. We should never allow ourselves to go back to the mundane 
to the routine. Can you imagine the shepherds had to go back to work the next night? Can you imagine that they sat there and they said, well, let's just go back and just do regular routine and forget completely about what we just saw last night. I wonder if they would start counting sheep and they'd look on the perimeter and they're watching for, and I wonder if every now and then they'd look up and go, and look to see if the angels had come back. And it's all so easy for those of us who've had this grand encounter to allow ourselves to go back to the mundane and the routine and almost forget that encounter we had with the glorious Lord. Don't ever forget, friend, when you really encountered Christmas. When you encountered Christ and it changed your life. Don't let it become routine and mundane again. Don't let it go back to what it was. It should propel us. It should change us. It should challenge us. It should change our future. It should change our choices. It should change our desires. It should change our passions. It should change everything about us. Because once you've encountered Him, once you've beheld Him, once you've seen it, nothing else will do. No other counterfeit comes close. Nothing else satisfies. Nothing else can touch you like that. When you've experienced what I'm talking about, when you've seen what they've seen, you can't just go back and say, I'll be satisfied satisfied with a few stars in the sky and a few sheep on the ground because when you've encountered the glory of a God like that man all of a sudden you can't just go back to being satisfied with the mundane and the routine if Christmas is real it's changed us forever and if it hasn't what good is it what good is it I want you to notice, secondly, the Christmas encouragement. Verse 10, you can imagine the Bible ended, verse 9, by saying they were greatly afraid, and rightly so, to come into the presence of God as sinful people would challenge any of us. And then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Just break that message down for a moment. The truth is that the shepherds had every right to be afraid in the presence of this Shekinah glory of God, this holy presence. And so should all of us. In our fallen sinful nature, we cannot stand in the presence of holy God. In fact, to bring our sinful selves into his presence is to expose our sin all the more. How many of you realize that the reason that we sneak away and crawl away from the things of God when we're backslidden and when we're not doing right in our life is because we don't want to get closer to God. We want to get further from Him because it makes us it makes us feel like our sin's not quite as bad as it ought to be because in the shadows it doesn't show up quite as staunchly but when you get closer to the Lord and the glory of the Lord shines in the heart of our lives and it shines on our thoughts and it shines on our motives and it shines on our actions all of a sudden we begin to realize even what we thought was okay in our our life is far from the holiness of God. If we really understood the holiness of God, then we would understand our sinfulness so much more, and it would cause us to be afraid in His presence. But the angel says, Don't fear. It is a great message. You see, the truth is, the Bible declares that we are enemies with God separated from him by our sin. And on this night, as they announced the birth of the Savior, this great message of no fear is mind-boggling. The idea that sinful man can be in the presence of holy God and not have to have fear was mind-boggling. But that's the message of the gospel that they came to bring that night. 
It wasn't a message of, hey, God is, God is just going to wink and nod, nod at your sin. God is this benevolent grandfather who understands your weaknesses, and he's just going to look the other way. That's not the message of Christmas. Neither is it the message of Christmas that God said, hey, you just be good religious people. You just go to church and you do the things that you can do and don't worry about the rest. God's going, to, God's going to understand and it'll be okay. That's not the message. The message is that the gospel is that God has sent his son into this world and he died on the cross so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins. Forgiven of our rebellion against holy God. And God could remove all of that stuff that's between us so that we now can be robed in the righteousness of Christ and enter into the presence of the holiness of God without fear. Not because we're good, not because we're moral, not because we're religious, not because we deserve it, but because Christ has enrobed us and we get in on his name. We stand before him in his character. Do you get it? That's why there's no fear. The good news is, you can come before the Lord now because of Christ. He says, I've got good news of great joy. What's the good news? The good news is that God loves us and that God is for us. Think about it. If God didn't love us and left us to ourselves, he would say, you figure it out. You chose to live in rebellion against me. You chose this life. You chose this path. You figure it out. Here's the truth. If God had left us to our own designs, then hell would be our home for eternity. And we have no hope of changing that because we can't be good enough. We can't keep the law enough. We can't be religious enough. Our own righteousness is filthy rags before that Shekinah glory, holiness of God. So that wasn't going to work. We couldn't do it. God knew we couldn't do it. God could have said, well, you got yourself in it, so I have no pity on you. And yet the mercy of God calls the heart of God to be moved with pity and compassion for us. And he said, I will make a way for you. That's the good news, folks, of great joy. You can try and strive all you want to, but the good news of great joy is when you can't and you can't and when you couldn't and you couldn't, God did. Hmm. And finally, this Christmas encouragement from the angel is that this message, this good news, this gospel is for all people. It's for you. You say, preacher, it can't be for me. You don't know me. You don't know the stuff that's in my past. You don't know the stuff that's in my life. You don't know the stuff that's in my mind. You don't know the stuff that's in my heart. You don't know the things that I've done. I'm here to tell you that God said this gospel, this good news of great joy is for every single one of us. It's for everybody. It doesn't know boundaries of countries. It doesn't know boundaries of nationalities. It doesn't know boundaries of social or economic dividers. This gospel of good news is for everyone. Don't you get it? It's from the shepherd field to the palace. It's for everyone in between. This good news is for all people, for any who will receive Christ and be forgiven of their sins. It's for all of us. Thirdly and finally, I want you to notice the Christmas exaltation. Hmm. The Bible tells us in verse 13 and 14, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Wow. I just want you to stop and hear this for a moment. Glory. It's the Greek word doxa. It means to honor. It means to praise. It means to worship. The angels said you need to honor. You need to glory. You need to praise the Lord for this good news. That this God would so love you and see you in your desperate situation. That he would come to get you and redeem you in spite of your rebellion toward him. I want you to think about that a moment. That God didn't come and get us because we were good. God didn't come and get us because we loved him. God came and got a group of people 
who had chosen to rebel against him, thumb thumb their noses at him, live against what he's taught them. The Bible even says the only reason we now can love him is because he first loved us. It wasn't our love for him that compelled him to love us. He loved us when we despised him. He came for his enemies, ladies and gentlemen, to make us family. Think about it. We ought to worship him and we ought to give him praise. We ought to give him glory. We ought to give him honor. And he says, glory to God in the highest. The Greek word is hupsistos. And it means in the highest rank or order. Here's what the angels are telling us. We ought to give God glory, honor, praise, worship of the highest rank. You know what that means? That means there's nothing above him. That means that we honor him uh, above our own selves. We honor him above our career. We honor him above our passions and our desires and our want. We honor him above our teams. We honor him above our marriage. We honor him above our children. He is God and God alone. And he is worthy of our worship and our praise. And there's nothing above him. There's nothing that we want more, desire more, love more, care about more, honor more, praise more, worship more, give more time to, more attention to, give more passion to, give more of anything, including our resources to. He is the one that we praise, worship, and honor in the highest regard. Anything else? Anything else? is wasted. God doesn't want nor will he accept the crumbs. God has come with great news. He's made the greatest of all sacrifices. He gave his son to die for you. He didn't die for you to say thank you. I've now got fire insurance. Merry Christmas to me. And then go out and live however you were living before. He didn't do that. He didn't come and send his son and sacrifice him on the cross to die so that you could then go out and say, oh, well, look, I've got heaven taken care of. Now I can do what I want. I can get all my wants and I can get the things I'm passionate and thirsty and hungry for and I can fulfill all of my desires. No, 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 no. He came for you to die to yourself. And if he's given you real life, ladies and gentlemen, the gift of Christmas so takes over your life that... The old things have passed away, the scripture says. And behold, all things are made new. Hmm. Rarely does a gift change our lives. Hear me, I'm almost done. Rarely does a gift change our lives. I want you to think about it. Those of you that are older like myself, right? You remember... Do you remember that one great present somewhere along in your childhood that you wanted? Well, did you get it? How long did it satisfy you? How long did it thrill you? A week? A month? By next Christmas, did you even remember that you'd wanted it last Christmas? See, those of us that have been there, some of y'all got these new babies. So in a couple of days, Santa Claus is going to have a stack about this high because y'all got excited. And they're going to play with the bows and the papers. And you're going to keep taking the stuff that they threw away the presents from Santa, and you're going to keep handing it to them, and they're going to keep putting it down and grabbing the bows and the paper. (laughs) See, rarely, rarely, rarely does a gift change your life. Some of y'all think, some of you teenagers think, man, if there would just be a new car in the driveway with my name on it and some keys, that'd change my life. (laughs) No, it wouldn't. In a couple of months, you'd even forget, and you wouldn't treat it with the same care. And in a few years, when you've worn it out, 
By then you're old enough to buy your own car. You'll trade it in. And you'll get another one. Rarely does a gift change our life. In fact, this will be my 48th Christmas. I don't remember most of them. What I got. But this fall that just passed, in fact, last month, I've been saved for 44 years. And I've never forgotten the details of that moment. I can tell you where I was. I can tell you what I said. I can tell you who I talked to. I can tell you the counselor who's now dead and gone to glory, Mr. Bill Hardiman, Bible teacher extraordinaire, deacon, was the one who counseled me and led me in the sinner's prayer. I can tell you everything about it. It was the old downtown sanctuary at the First Baptist Church of Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. I went down to my pastor. He handed me off to Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman took me to the back. I can still see that little room with the cinder block walls, you know. I can still smell the smells. I can't do that for any Christmas I've ever lived, any, any gift that I've ever been given. But the gift that changed my life, I've never forgotten every detail around it. Think about that. You know why? Because it is absolutely the greatest gift ever given. And if you've never received it, there's no time like Christmas. The angel said, now because of this, there can be peace, goodwill toward men. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says for those of us who are not in Christ, we're enemies of God. We're at war with him. There is no peace with God. But when we come to Christ, we now have peace with God because he has wiped away our sin, which is the source of our enmity. And he has brought us into his family and we are now called His. The goodwill of God that He's willing to sacrifice His own Son so that you and I could be forgiven. And it is the gift that can and will change your life forever. Would you bow your heads? So Father, now we come to this time. We praise You. We thank You. Christmas is all about You. That You loved us in spite of ourselves and that you sent your own son to be born right here of a virgin in this earth to enrobe himself in flesh God incarnate and he would live a perfect life and die on a cross